Hey everybody. I've got my baking tray back so we can continue with the third and I think probably final part of multi-power, how it works. But before we start, um, there's a correction from the previous episode. A um, couple of people were kind enough to point out to me um, I'd made a mistake, which yeah, I had. Uh, I said that it was high multi-power was a 10% overdrive and low multi-power was a small underdrive. That's not correct. High multi-power is about 10% overdrive and low multi-power is about a half a percent overdrive. So even in low multi-power you're still faster or slightly faster than a um, just a conventional three-speed or six-speed. Anyway, with that said, let's just quickly have a recap over what components we've got here. If you remember, that is the main input shaft for the gearbox. There's the input shaft for the PTO and hydraulic pump. Input shaft housing, multi-power control valve, that's the PTO drive gear. If you look when that rotates, that's the um, PTO input shaft turning. Multi-power clutch. That's the bit that engages and disengages when you flick the lever and open that spool valve. High multi-power there and there. Low multi-power, that gear and that gear. And this big helical gear here is what transfers the drive back up to the main shaft for the conventional gearbox uh, and that spigot there just slides into a little bearing on the end of the main gearbox main shaft okay so drive comes in through here goes down through multi-power and then depending on whether high or low is engaged it's transferred back up to the conventional gearbox to this one does that make sense? Right. First thing we need to look at here is that when multi-power is not engaged, high multi-power is not engaged, this gear here is not attached to this shaft at all. So that gear can rotate freely. Low multi-power, however, is splined onto that shaft. When we get down to the counter shaft, high multi-power here is splined onto the counter shaft, but low multi-power isn't. So, when the clutch is engaged, this gear will turn with the engine it's splined onto this, it engages with, it's engaged, sorry, with this gear, which is splined onto this shaft, so high multi-power goes in here, that gear, through that gear, and back out into the main gearbox, which is sitting there. Now when there's no hydraulic pressure, and low multi-power is engaged, that gear, of course, the clutch is not engaged so that gear is free to turn on its own and drive will come through this gear and it'll drive that gear which if you remember we said just now look I'm turning this here that gear is loose so how does drive get from that gear onto this shaft and back into the conventional gearbox well, inside here, again, is where the magic happens. Okay, so we've all had a good look at how the input shaft works and the clutch. So let's move down to the counter shaft. As we just said, this is the high multi-power gear and that is splined onto the end of the counter shaft. So that if that gear is turning, the counter shaft is turning as well. The low multi-power gear 
and what we've got is a spring that fits inside this and a thrust washer as well um, and that spring sits there. Now what you'll see is this I talked in part two about the overrun dog clutch. Well, that's what we've got here. And if you notice, as I slide it out, it rotates slightly because it's mounted onto helical splines. And that is the, uh, that's the, uh, the feature if you like. Also if you notice looking at the those teeth end on they're not symmetrical. They've got a low side, a ramp and a high side. So what that does is allows this when it's engaged there. Right. When you're in high multi-power the drive is coming from here onto this, which is splined onto the end there. That is transmitting power directly to this counter shaft. Okay, so the counter shaft is turning and the low gear is disengaging because It will be sliding up that ramp, disengaging and pushing against that spring. So that is how low switches to high. Now when you're in low, the clutch here, if you remember, is depressurized. So that gear is free to rotate and that gear that's attached directly to the main input shaft from the clutch plate there and that's transferring drive, drive directly to this. Now, this time, as this is free to rotate on the counter shaft, so the counter shaft will rotate without that gear. So what happens is because it's rotating and it's pushing against the... If you look, there's, as I said earlier, it's a moment ago, there's a low side and a high side and a ramp on those teeth. Okay, so when you're in low, this gear is being driven and it's rotating in such a way that it pushes against the high side of these teeth. So it's also pushing against these splines, these helical splines here. So it's actually engaging this gear, allowing this one to freewheel and transferring the, the drive back up here into the gearbox. However, when you are on a slope and you find that your forward speed is increasing, what then happens is that it trans instead of the drive being driven against the high side of the teeth and against these splines the drive is coming back from the wheels and it's coming against the pushing against the low side of these teeth and the ramp which allows it to disengage with only the spring pressure there holding it it allows that to disengage and that's why you've got no engine braking in low does that make sense it should do Anyway, the other thing that people always ask is, well, why can it be difficult to change gear when you're in high? When you've got your foot on the clutch and it locks, doesn't, you, won't, you can't roll backwards down hills and things like that. That's quite simple. You're in high, that gear is locked by the clutch, so drive is going through that gear. That gear is also locked. You've got pressure pushing backwards against these splines here. 
and you have got pressure pushing against these teeth here. So if you like, the, two, the high and low gears lock, um, which is why you have that um, feature that stops it from rolling back on hills when, you, uh, when you're in high multi-power. If you find it's difficult to change gear, you just flick it to low, lose the pressure in here for a second, and it takes all the, uh, um, all the force that's inside the gearbox that's making it difficult to disengage the gears. It's dissipated, and you can once more change gear again. It's pretty simple when you look at it like that, isn't it? Anyway, hopefully... That's given you an insight into how multipower works. So the last part of this video is um, going to be just a little bit on what can go wrong, what does go wrong, um, and what it costs to fix. Well, as you can see, it's simple. There isn't really a lot that can go wrong with it. These teeth and these parts of the components of the dog clutch, I guess they can wear out. I have not personally seen one that's done that. Um, I have heard of it, but I've not personally seen one. Not much to go wrong here. The only areas that I have seen problems, and I've seen quite regular problems, is in the clutch here. If you're in low multi-power for a long time, this clutch can overheat. So when you're working in low, it's always a good idea to flick to high for a few minutes just to keep the oil flowing through there. If you don't, you can overheat that clutch, you can cause premature wear in the friction plates, uh, you can cause the friction plates to warp, and that's when you're going to start to get problems. If you do get wear in these plates here, and as I say, that's usually caused by running in low for too long periods without flicking to high, that will show up as the um, multi-power slipping in high. So it will, um, you'll be able to drive it in low, but as soon as you slip it, switch it to high, you will um, kind of start to lose drive and, and, and get problems that way. Another thing that can is the seals inside here. There's high pressure seals in here because as I said in I think the second video, this is a this cylinder contains a hydraulic actuator. If the seals go in that again you'll find it difficult to engage high and it will slip. Um, another area again in here is that the plates warp. If they overheat through lack of lubrication, running in low for too long, um, they can warp, and that's the point where you will find it difficult to disengage high because these plates will drag and they will keep transferring drive to this gear even when you want it in low. Um, and the other real problem that I've seen with these is on the input shafts. I think if you can go back to video two, you'll remember that I said there's a, a groove in the input shaft here um, that has two cast iron piston rings in it that are the main hydraulic seal for when the oil goes from the spool valve down into the actuator inside the clutch here. Now, the, main sh the input shaft can wear... Um, and you can lose pressure that way. The rings can break up and they can wear, uh, so you can lose pressure that way. Um, or the input shaft carrier itself can get grooves worn in it, um, and again, you'll lose pressure that way. The way that often manifests itself is you will find that the bell housing, the clutch, just fills up with oil because this is only ever intended to be a low pressure seal in here. The actual high pressure sealing is um, managed by those piston rings in there. If there's any kind of leakage around there, you've got something like 3,000 psi 
coming out through a fairly low pressure seal and you will just get so much oil coming out here that you'll immediately know what the problem is. Anyway, that's given you an insight into the most common things that can go wrong with it. Now, the cost. That's another thing that people often worry about. For me to strip down a multi-power gearbox will take 40 minutes on a good day. Nothing's, no, no real problems. It just about 40 minutes to get it all apart. To rebuild the clutches, put new seals, new bearings, just to do a proper refurbishment job on it, it's about another hour and a half to put it back together. So, apart once you split the tractor or got the cab off or whatever it is, it's not a big job to get these things taken apart and, uh, and repaired. So, you don't need any special tools either. There's nothing inside this gearbox that your average home gamer um, won't have in his toolbox or her toolbox for that matter. So again, nothing to, be scared of, nothing to be scared of in there. And finally, cost. People get excited about the cost of these things. Oh my God, multi-power brakes, it's going to cost a fortune. Well, pretty well all of these parts are available from Vapormatic, from um, AgriLine, from SpareX, or, or all the um, aftermarket parts manufacturers. And most are still available from Agco. If you need to replace the auxiliary pump, that, if you remember, is the fellow that sits on top of the pump. Let's have some light. And is driven from that big gear that you can see down there. Again, not a hard job to replace and that will set you back about £200. Um, it's going to be pretty much the same in dollars or euros. It's around 200 or whatever it is you've got to spend. Clutch plates, about £7 each. The rings, cast iron rings that go on the input shaft, again, 2 to £3. Seal kit for the clutch pack there. Again, I think that was about four pounds. So even if you're going to do a complete rebuild of this gearbox, all new bearings, um, shafts, even the input carrier here, the spool valve seals, um, the whole lot, you're going to be spending less than a thousand pounds to do this gearbox. And then you'll effectively have a new gearbox. So again, price means there's nothing to be afraid of. Anyway, hopefully that has been not too boring. Um, hopefully it's been actually useful. So anyway, let me know what you think in the comments. And, um, oh, yeah, and don't just say, yeah, but dual power is better because we're not even talking about the same thing. And if that's really the limit of your conversation, yeah, keep it yourself. Anyway, to everyone else, thanks for watching and uh, see you soon. Bye.